So now you can stand. If Now I'm going to read a healthy portion of Scripture. Leviticus 19. If you can't stand for long, feel free to stay seated. No condemnation. But I want you to hear the flavor of Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 outlines many laws. And then chapter 20 tells the discipline for breaking those laws. We're not going there. That's not the purpose of the message today. <clears throat> now, as, as I read this, listen very carefully because what is happening in this chapter is an illustration of the Ten Commandments. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect his mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you sacrifice a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the next day. Anything left over until the third day must be burned up. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is impure and will not be accepted. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because he has desecrated what is holy to the Lord. That person must be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your neighbor, your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep my decrees. Do not make different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. If a man sleeps with a woman who is a slave girl promised to another man, but who has not been ransomed or given her freedom, there must be due punishment. Yet they are not to be put to death because she had not been freed. The man, however, must bring a ram to the entrance of the tent of meeting for a guild offering to the Lord. With the ram of the guild offering, this priest is to make atonement for him before the Lord for the sin he has committed and his sin will be forgiven. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are to consider it forbidden, it must not be eaten. In the fourth year all of its fruit will be holy, an offering to praise an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord your God. Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it. Do not practice divination or sorcery. Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute or the land will turn to prostitution and be filled with wickedness. Observe, observe my Sabbaths. And have reverence for my sanctuary, I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Rise in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or Quantity, use honest scales and honest weights and honest ephah and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Keep all my decrees and all the laws and follow them. I am the Lord. Lord, we ask you to anoint the preaching of your word. May the, lips, may the words of my lips, Lord, be pleasing before you. Have your way, O Lord. We ask that your spirit would minister now and speak to us. Open our hearts, Lord. Protect our minds from the enemy who would bring distraction or confusion or frustration. We surrender to you again. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now, how many of you just wish that you could live under Old Testament law? 
I just want to obey every one of these. Aren't you glad that we don't have to live under Old Testament law? The word for holy means pure, sacred, free from moral imperfection. And that's the key. God is looking for us to be holy. And in that day and age, these were the ways that people could be holy. Why is it so important? You know, when I say holiness, I know some of you automatically tune out. The light switch goes off, eyes go dim, and you're keeping your eyes open so I won't come stand beside you. But today, what I wanted to preach, actually, this was on the sermon schedule. And so I'm willing to adjust because of what the Lord wants. And about four days ago, I was just burdened by the needs of this church. By talking with people and hearing of people who have been coming under condemnation, who are struggling who feel as though they're not able to come out from under trials. And I said, Lord, Romans 5, 4 and 5 would be a good sermon to preach this week. Don't you think? No. Don't you think it would be really good, Lord? <clears throat> no. Well, actually, it wasn't a conversation like that. It was more like, Lord, I think I really should preach Romans. So I went into prayer. And after probably a day of prayer, I had an overwhelming feeling. I didn't hear words. I sensed that I got the answer in a different way, way different from what I usually do. It was an overwhelming sense of his presence saying, I am to preach on holiness today. It's like, okay, Lord. So we opened the service the way we did. In this season, in our nation, in this time in history, even if you and I weren't living in the United States of America, in this season in history, in 2015, from the beginning of the world to now, this is God's message to His church. It's going to take courage for you to do it. You know what the main point is? It's pretty simple. Be holy. But it goes beyond that. Because we're told in the New Testament that no one is justified by obeying the law. God gave us the law the New Testament says to shut us up from justifying ourselves. Because we're going to fall short. There's no one here who can obey every, every one of these commandments. It's not going to happen. If you start to do it, you know what's going to happen? You're going to become a Pharisee. And you're going to get hard-hearted toward God and hard-hearted toward man. And you're going to start expecting people around you to obey every letter of the law. And you know what happens then? Because you're growing hard-hearted is you lose your relationship with God. Now, for the sake of those who believe that one cannot lose one's salvation, that's true. The Scripture warns us that we can fall away. Now, let's, for the, because there are so many here, let's just clarify this. The Scripture teaches the elect and that those who are in the hand of God cannot be taken. The love of God, you know, overcomes all those who are going to enter the kingdom of God are going to enter, period. That's God's perspective. But from man's perspective, we are warned not to fall away, and we are warned about the dangers of becoming hard-hearted and falling away. From our perspective, men fall away. From God's perspective, no one is lost. Folks, we live in this world. There are those who are going to enter the kingdom of God. God looks throughout history, looks out throughout time, outside time, and He knows that Dan Samson is going to trust in the Lord. He's going to look and see that Sam Nino trusts in the Lord. He's going to see if I'm faithful, and if I'm faithful, doing what he's called me to in my relationship, as he looks through time, I become one of the elect. Or, he looks through time and he sees where eventually my heart will grow hardened toward the Lord and I'm not going to be one of the elect. I don't fear for my salvation. I cling to Jesus. Hebrews 12.14 says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Folks, how are we going to see the Lord living with the flesh? There's nobody here who sometime during the course of a day doesn't say, I don't like that person very much. And it's not just because of the four-way stop. Could be waiting in the grocery line. How many of you, when you go up to a, a line at any store and the lines are long, you look for the shortest line. 
and you make a beeline for it. Now you tell me, when somebody cuts you off and gets in line ahead of you in that short line, don't you go... That's the sin nature. And that right there is sin. That's not holiness. That's the opposite of holiness. How are we going to do it? How are we going to see... How are we going to see God if we can't be holy? It's not in our nature to be holy. Nobody's good enough. However, remember prayer time? God's heart is tender toward us. He's given us the ability to be holy because He's given Himself to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the main point of this message today is be holy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Just and simplify it. Be holy through the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean that when you receive Christ, you're holy and you can live any way you want and God will see holiness even though you misbehave. That's not the way it works. Holiness is living in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. In cooperation with the Holy Spirit. God never takes us over and makes us do the right thing. The Holy Spirit won't take us over and make us do the right thing. But the Holy Spirit will show us what the right thing is to do, and then it's up to us to do it. And when we do, we walk in holiness. Amen? Now, you could look in this and you could say, Sam, there's so much in that book. I don't care if I got the Holy Spirit. There's no way I'm ever going to remember every law and know what to do. How many could say amen to that? And, you know, i got to admit that I forget things every so often. You wouldn't be... Yeah. No. You couldn't believe that. I remember my name so far. It's better than some of you. No. Folks, God has made it simple for us because He knows that we're but flesh and bone. If you take all the law, it boils down to two categories. Two categories types of situations. And that's it. Really simple. And the Holy Spirit will help us in both each of those types. Under those two broad categories are every situation you'll ever encounter. What are the two greatest commandments? To love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And what's the one that's like it? Love your neighbor as yourself. What was that? That's right, Audrey. No other commandments greater than these. And so, all of the law of the prophets summed up love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus gave us a new commandment. Love one another as I've loved you, sacrificially. But that's still loving our neighbor. So, what's the first broad category? Opportunities to honor God directly. The Holy Spirit will help us to be holy in those opportunities where we get to honor God directly. And that's out of this passage, this chapter, actually. Three, three ways that I, I come up with that we, we encounter God directly over the course of a day or a week or a month in our lives. As represented by His person. Represented here, it says, don't swear falsely by my name. Right? Right? When we use His name in vain, we're coming directly against Him personally. But that's not the only way that we encounter Him personally. Anyone ever sense His presence? I shared with you. I was saying, okay, Lord, I don't want to preach this message. I want to preach that message. And it was His presence that said, I want you to preach on holiness this week. How many of you in the course of a week know that there are times when all of a sudden you think about God and you say, okay, Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? See, sometimes that awareness, that being moved to think about Him when we're out in daily life, that's His presence coming to us and saying, hey, I'm here, Sambo. I'm here, Darlene. I'm here, Brandy. I'm here, Gunner. I'm here. And we hesitate and we say, okay. And we kind of hesitate. We say, okay, Lord, this is what I want to do. What would you have me do? You know what I mean? That is an opportunity to honor God directly. 
Because it is his presence that's there that's getting your attention to say, hey, I'm here. Other illustrations or examples from this chapter where he says, don't make idols. Whenever we worship anyone or anything else, when we put anything at a greater, anything or anyone at a greater value than our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are performing idolatry and we are coming against God's person. And so, it's, it, if you find that you've elevated something greater than God, it doesn't mean you're going to hell. It does not mean that. It is an opportunity to repent and turn back toward God and say, forgive me, Lord, and He will forgive you. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And, 1 John 1, 9, if we admit, acknowledge, confess our sin to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us. But repentance is required. Required. Okay, I'll say it. How many of you men don't read something before you try to put it together? You don't read the directions. My family has learned, well, Sam, you know, well, Dan, why didn't you read it 15 minutes ago, right? It's kind of like repentance. You know, wisdom says read the directions first. Wisdom says, Proverbs says, listen to the Lord and repent. Right? You see, life is simpler if we read the directions as we go or beforehand. Life is simpler if we repent when we become aware of our sin. Okay, I had to say that. Superstition, divination, mediums, superstition. Some of the things in here are superstition. They think, they theorize that the reason some of these things that are in here, like two different types of material being put together, out of paganism, false worship, trying to get a false god to do something. Cutting one's body for the dead. Cutting the sides of their hair. Trimming their beard a certain way. was all superstition. It was trying to get some false god who doesn't exist, who's a demonic spirit, to do what they wanted them to so they could have a happier life. Whatever that looks like. That's superstition. Do you have a lucky coin that you carry with you and you're afraid that things won't go well if you don't carry it? A lucky... Rabbit's foot, that's superstition. That's coming against the presence of God. Because we are to trust in Him and Him alone. Not in something that can't do anything. You know, if you want a lucky rabbit's foot, quit calling it lucky and use it to scratch your back. I don't have any problem with it. But as soon as you start putting your trust in it, yeah, it's a hindrance between you and God is represented by God's commands. He says, observe the Sabbath. Honor and respect your mom and your dad. Those are commands. And so, as we come across things that God tells us to do, that's an opportunity to honor Him just simply by obeying. Those who love me will obey my word. And I will come live with them and the Father will come with them. Jesus said in John, in the teens, the Gospel of John. District Council week ago, two weeks ago, whenever it was. I don't think I shared this last week. I had an opportunity for obedience and I didn't want to do it. During the worship service, Dwayne Durst is sitting up there, district superintendent, Bill Kirk, the guest speaker for the night. It was an evening service. Place is full. I don't even remember what it was for, missions or what. And during worship, God said to me, I want to heal tonight. You know, if it were in church here, I would just act on it. I'm a little person in a sanctuary with two or a couple hundred people. A lot of pastors, missionaries, delegates, you know, families. It's like, what do you want me to do with Number one, I'm not sure I'm hearing from God. Number two, what do you want me to do if it is you, God? Well, the thought came to me, we'll go up and tell the people on the podium. Yeah, right. Number one, I'm not sure I'm hearing from you, God. Number two, I don't want to go up there. There's like a bunch of steps. The altar was higher than this. In front of 200 people, you're crazy. Plus, I'm not sure it's you, so I'm just going to stand right here. Pennies on one side of me, autos on the other side. They must have thought there was an earthquake taking place. Because I couldn't get... I was... 
I was gnawing my teeth. I was gnawing on my knuckles. It's like, I don't know this is you, God. I don't want to embarrass myself. And finally, just before worship ended, it's like, okay, i got to get this out of my system. All I have to do is go up there, get one person's attention, tell them it, go back to my seat, and then it's between them and God. It's over with. If it's not God, nobody will know what I said. If it is God, He gets the glory. Somebody gets healed. i got to do this. So I almost lunged over Otto to get out of the seat. I went up. Bill Kirk looks at me. Thank God I know Bill Kirk. He came... Now, this, this is going to mean something to some of you. He came to the forward of the altar, to the edge of the altar. He knelt down and I whispered, I think God wants to heal somebody. I don't know. Some, one you or Dwayne or somebody needs to do something. That's the long and the short of it. And, you know, he looked like I would at that point because they have an agenda that they're going to follow. And he's like, I couldn't tell what he was thinking. You ever been there with me? I couldn't tell what he was thinking. Is he mad at me? Or, you know, what's he thinking? He's not going to rebuke me in front of 200 people with that one. But he could be miffed at me. So I go back to my seat, and I just kind of collapse in the chair and say, okay, Lord, it's between you and them. They had an altar call. It was for something else at the end of the night, you know, response. We heard the next day we left. I had the sermon to work on, 10, 30, 11. I'm working on the sermon at night. The next day we heard that someone had been healed after we'd left. But it's, you know, whether somebody's not healed or not, but it's, it was like, okay, that really was God, I guess. Do you hear what I'm saying? We, we obey the Lord. There are places in the Word that we can just read and we know. And there are times when the Spirit asks us to do something, and it's up to us to obey. And folks, sometimes obeying just, it costs us, right? We have to humble ourselves and say, okay, it's not about me. Who cares? what they think. Who cares if I'm wrong? If, if this really is the word of the Lord, to not say it could hinder somebody from receiving from God. And you know what? Ultimately, I've got to trust Him. And if I'm wrong, He knows my heart. He'll take care of me. But if I'm right, I'm just doing the simple thing that He's asked me to do. He's the one that's got to do it. And then I dump it on Bill, and Bill's got to figure out what to do with it. Does that make sense? That's cooperating with the Holy Spirit. You're just you're a cog in God's machine, but He loves you. You know He doesn't just come and grease a zerk. Remember, you learned what zerks were last week, right? Grease fittings. And so He doesn't just come and grease you. He loves you. As He ministers to you and gives you that opportunity to walk in holiness, because that's all holiness is is, a, is cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And every every time that He says this is this is a chance to do something that I'm asking you to. See, that's walking in holiness. That's, that's what this chapter is about. Walking in holiness is just doing what God asks us to. And the Holy Spirit makes it simple. He says, this is an opportunity. Joey, this is an opportunity, Dan. This is an opportunity, Dan and Christine. And when you do it, you're walking in holiness. When you don't, you don't walk in holiness. Don't come under condemnation. God will give you a second chance. Maybe not on that same point. But he's a good God. He, he grades on the curve. That's not even a good way to put it. The good, right way to put it is that he knows that we're but dust. And that we're, we're scared. We're slow learners in some instances. And he loves us with great love. And he will walk with us if we're tenderhearted to... He'll help us grow. Through a painful process sometimes. And is represented by his wisdom. Verses 23 through 25 says, you know, don't eat the fruit from the tree the first year it's grown. That sounds like wisdom to me. And there are times when his commands sound like commands, but they're his wisdom. Don't have sex outside marriage. Why? Because it protects everyone involved. That's wisdom. He gives it to us for holiness to protect us. See, holiness is often wound with what's good. Well, that's what it is, moral perfection. It's, it's intertwined with what is good. So, first broad category, opportunities to honor God directly. The second broad category is to honor others. You could see that one coming three miles away. By protecting them, by preferring them, by helping them. By protecting them. It says, don't do any harm to your neighbor. Don't slander him. Don't seek revenge on him. Well, if you're not going to seek revenge on him, does it sound like you're more interested in protecting him? 
There, there are a number of these laws in here and commands that could fit under protection, helping and caring for, or preferring. Depends on how you want to look at it. Rise in the presence of those who are aged. <laughs> who here is aged? Sister Jean, you're over. Surely. They're sitting side by side. You're, you know, you're, but that's a place of honor. We do it because God has told us to. But showing honor to those who are older than we are. Now, don't go doing that to me. <laughs> Donna, don't do it to me. When we, for those who are, have earned that status, we're showing we care. We're honoring God. We're also saying that we care to the person. How many of you know that when a person gets toward the later years of life, life gets hard? <laughs> I don't even want to know who that one was. It can encourage them. It shows that we still care. It shows that they're not alone. It shows that they have value. You know, the daughter is not to be given as a prostitute. Well, most of us don't give our daughters as prostitutes, but sometimes we don't protect them as we could. When we listen to them, dads, if you give them time, you're helping protect them. You treat your wife right. You show her love. Get her something for your anniversary, for her birthday. You know, show kindness and, and treat her well. Show her respect. And that, that protects your daughter. Show kindness and love toward your son. That protects your son. Treat him well. When they get to be in their teens, listen to them. Don't, t- don't micromanage manage your teenagers. Put yourself in their sphere. Be quiet. Listen. Let them talk. And when they talk, don't judge everything they say. Just be there. And you'll hear what's in their heart. You'll have a relationship with which to... To give them counsel. Because you listen and you love and then they're going to seek your counsel sometimes. How much better that than micromanage and they get mad and then they hide things from you and you don't know what's going on? And it de-escalates. Goes, it gets bad. Worse. By preferring them at the four-way stop. I was there first, but I'll let you go. Oh, you, you went anyway. Well, that's okay. God bless you on your way. <laughs> God loves us. Everyone. Helping and caring for him. He, he mentions the disabled. Giving wages to those that have earned it. Taking care of the stranger by not judging. By having fair business practices. That is all saying, I care about you. When you're at the state fair and you go the, to the baked potato line and you're intelligent enough not to go there at noon, I'm sorry, if you went at noon and there were 300 people in front of you, I'm not questioning your intellect, but I'm going to say, would you do it again that way next year? Go early. And this one huge family moves in front of you and you're trying to, to be one of the first ones to get that baked potato before there's a crowd. What's your heart like? See, that's an opportunity the Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, they're just as important as you are. This is an opportunity for holiness just in your attitude toward them. You know, as we, as we people, you go to the gas station, right? And you pull up to the pump, or you're, you're trying to rearrange your car to get the pump on the right side of the car, and somebody drives in to that pump. You know what I'm saying? They took your pump! You must wonder, how can he faster? <laughs> oh, I'm human. Give me my new buddy and get it over with. That's an opportunity, right? To walk in holiness. Pray you for yourself. Pray for that person. <laughs> Don't say that, God, get him out of here in a hurry. God tested me this on this this week. <laughs> you were wondering, oh, my life. I can see it now, the days of Sam's life. <laughs> <laughs> I 
what Wednesday night? I get home. I get home from church Wednesday night, you know, family night. I go home. It's been a long day. And I get a phone call. I talk to someone for close to an hour. And I get off the phone and, and someone had tried calling me during that phone call. It's like, okay, I guess the day's not over yet. So I called him. He goes to another church. It's actually Kai Towers. I'll use the names. We won't protect the innocent in this case. Kai was trying to get home. Kai never calls me. So I called him back. And there was a fellow who had gone to Christian Assembly. He'd gone to Lowe's and Fishes. He'd missed the bus. And so he needed a ride back to Ithaca. So Kai gave him a ride, and while he was traveling with him, he found out the fellow is homeless. And he found out the fellow knows me because the fellow used to come here. He has disabilities. He's my age, but he has the mental capacity of someone who's preteens or younger. And so Kai took him in and dropped him off, and the fellow wanted to be dropped off at Olin Library up at Cornell because Olin Library is open late, and then he'd go from there down to the shortstop, which is open all night, and he would be safe. So Kai had been trying to get a hold of me when he had this fellow in the car with him. And, of course, I couldn't answer the phone. So I called, and Kai was saying, you know, I'm worried about him being safe through the night. What do you want me to do about it? It's what I, you know, it's like, okay, I know him. You know him. Do you were there with him. (laughs) So I get off the phone. I tell Kai, well, you know, I'm making it up as I go. I'm praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm just saying, Lord, I don't, what do I do? I, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's actually, by this time, it's about 10.30 at night. Going to Olin Library seems like just foolishness. I said, okay. I called the homeless shelter in Ithaca. Found out that he'd been there before. They knew who he was. They were willing to have him come. All I had to do was bring him. So I kissed my wife, who's dead dog, tired from substituting and she, God bless her, she stayed awake for me. She didn't stay awake for me, but she stayed on the couch until I come home. That's our protocol. She won't go to bed until I'm home. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's the right response. So she, she's, I, she just KO'd. But God bless her. She called me on my way home said, where are you? Make sure I was okay. So I went to Olin Library. Now, this is not Sam trying to earn brownie points with God. This is certainly not Sam because he wants to. This is Sam saying, okay, Lord, I'm doing this because I, I've been doing this sermon and it talks about the people with disabilities. Right? It's like, well, I've been studying it. You could say, you could plead ignorance. I can't plead ignorance. Okay, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work. I'm just going to go do it. I'll go to Olin Library. I'll see if he's there. I took my flashlight. I left my knife behind because it's a campus. I carry jackknives wherever I go. I don't have one today because I'm told I have too much stuff in my pockets anyway. So I went to Olin Library. It's, it's 11 o'clock at night. Well, I thought I went to Olin Library. <laughs> the story is richer than this, but I'll condense it. So I finally, I get to this building with lights on, but nobody's home. There's no, I can't sign, find a sign. There are people, you know, a few people, and I'm hoping they're not muggers around campus. And a guy jogs by me, and I hailed him. He pulled out his earbuds, and I said, where's Olin Library? He said, it's that building over there where I'd been. He said, they're closed. You know, There aren't a lot of students on campus. That was the only... I, if it had been open, I'd have gone inside, and I'd have been praying, Lord, I don't know where this guy's going to be. Is he going to... I pray that he's downstairs where I can find him, because the library's probably big. So he's not there. You know, I, it's, all hope is lost. So I get back in the car, and I come home. Get home at 11.30. It's like I called Kai, told him the next day. I didn't call him at 11.30 at night. I did call him, I think. I, I think I did. I, I called him. It was 11 o'clock. I told him what was happening before I got home. And so it's like, okay, Lord, I don't know what that was about, but at least I did the right thing. The story doesn't end. The next day I get a phone call from Adam Gosser. He'd had an encounter with the same gentleman, so I told him about him. I got a call yesterday. Now I'm involved in trying to help him find a place to stay. You know, it's the Lord, it, it's, a, it's really, I share that with you so that you understand holiness is not feeling right and thinking the right thing the first thing. Holiness 
is having this, given the Spirit an opportunity to come to you and speak to you to show you what the right thing to do is. Holiness is doing the right thing, despite how you feel initially. Amen? Amen. Folks, we need the Spirit. We need the Spirit. I can't do it without Him. I wouldn't want to do it without Him. You need the Spirit. Would you stand with me, please? This fellow named R.E. Clement said, Human morality... Now, this is what our society doesn't get. Human morality must ultimately rest on the unchanging nature of God. If something is going to be moral, or if something is going to be immoral, it's not subjective. It's not based on what society says is right or wrong. It's based on God and His character. All of this is based on God and His character. He's the determined. He determines what is good and pure and just. He determines what is moral and immoral. Folks, and if you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and this is how you have Him, you acknowledge that you've broken God's law, that you're not good enough to get to heaven because no one is, and you call on the name of Jesus, believing He was raised from the dead. You call on the name of Jesus, wanting a relationship with Him, saying, I need you and I want you. See, that's from a place of need. You can't come to God saying, I have a great life and I just want you to get to heaven. You won't make it. You have to get to a place where you understand you have need. And Jesus is the only one who can meet that need. And then when you call on Him and you believe, He sends His Holy Spirit to live inside you. And He'll speak to you. He's a gentleman and you have your best friend. And then you can get more of the Holy Spirit by asking for more. God wants to give us more of Himself. He wants us to have more of Himself. He doesn't want a little tiny bit of the Holy Spirit in you and then all of you. Part of becoming conformed to the image of Jesus is becoming, being able to walk in the Spirit to be, allow the Spirit to become your leader. Jesus sent Him. He's one with the Father and Jesus. Would you ask God today to fill you with His Spirit? To just immerse you in His Spirit? Would you ask Him? May the Lord bless you. Let's just call upon Him and ask Him to fill us. Would you?